All right, well, I think it is seven o'clock and we will begin our discussion. You know, as a young man, John Lewis was among the civil rights activists and leaders who met with President Kennedy in the Oval Office. During that meeting, John Lewis was among those who told the president that there would be a march on Washington. And when that march happened, John Lewis was the youngest speaker. His words on that day and his life resonate with each of us today. Good evening, everyone. And on behalf of News 2 and the Coastal Crisis Chaplaincy, we welcome you as we are remembering and honoring the life and legacy of Congressman John Lewis. I'm Carol and Murray, and I'm so honored to be a part of this discussion. And I'd like to introduce our guests for this hour long Facebook Live. Our guests are U.S. Representative Joe Cunningham, South Carolina Representative David Mack III, President of the Charleston Chapter of the NAACP, Dot Scott, South Carolina Representative J.A. Moore, Reverend Dr. Kylon Middleton, Pastor of Mount Zion AME Church, former A2 Congressman Lewis, Sam Scarden, Chaplain Demet Jenkins of the Coastal Crisis Chaplaincy, and Reverend Cecilia Armstrong of St. James Presbyterian Church. Again, to each of our guests, thank you so much for being a part of this discussion. And to those watching and listening, thank you so much for being a part of this as well. I'd like to start with you, uh, Sam. Um, Sam, you eloquently um, talked about your relationship with Congressman Lewis as one of the most important relationships in your life. And you spend professional as well as personal time with him. Open our discussions with some of your first thoughts of when you met Congressman Lewis and the impact he's had in your life. Thanks, Carolyn. And thanks to News 2 for hosting this and everyone for joining us. Uh, Congressman Lewis is very special to me. He was uh, my first boss. I started working for him actually when I was still in college. I was 20 years old. He was my congressman over at uh, Emory University in Atlanta. And uh, I still remember the first time I met him. Uh, you, you were taken aback at how someone so accomplished and so important and so influential in American history could be so humble and so genuine and so down to earth. And that's exactly who he was. That's who he was the first time I met him uh, and who he continued to be for the years that I continued to work for him. Uh, I think the most inspiring thing and the reason that relationship was so happening on important so in my mind is you can see progress happen yeah. throughout his life. Uh, I think President Obama said he got to live his legacy. Uh, so even just little things lying around the office, uh, like a, a library card from the library in Troy, Alabama, when, where he was a kid growing up, yeah. wouldn't let him get a library card because of the color of his skin, and framed one and given him to really? him ceremonially like decades later. Uh, and then he was able to uh, even <laughs> earn an honorary degree from Troy State, who had not accepted his application uh, 40 years earlier because of the color of his skin. So uh, even everything uh, in his life, uh, he was able to turn into a symbol of progress. And I, I found that very inspiring and it's inspired me throughout the rest of my life. Sam talked about uh, his life in, in Troy, Alabama, and he was actually right outside of Troy, apparently an area that was even smaller, if that's possible. Uh, born the child of sharecroppers, but would eventually go on to college, went to Fisk University. Um, when we think of John Lewis, I think, um, Dot Scott, uh, Ms. Dot, talk about your first thoughts of, of John Lewis and your first meeting, perhaps. Uh, my first meeting was the opportunity when we invited him to our annual uh, Freedom Fund uh, gala. And, and that would have been in 2006. Uh, the two hours that he spent with us at that gala, I felt like you met a giant, even though none of his persona would be that to you. He was, what I say, quietly unassuming, but yet so powerful. Uh, when he spoke, his message was one that she just knew that this, whatever, his passion was, it was deep from the heart. 
So um, I was so reminded when I met him how early it started off in the civil rights movement at the around 19, 20 years old and the passion. And for that many years, we're talking more than seven, 60 years of that kind of fight. And it was the kind of thing when he spoke with power, it was still one of those engaging kind where you feel like you really want to, whatever it is that he believed that needs to be done, you felt that. And it's a period of time we spent with him that time and what I know of his life, I've read about his life. He was just one of those giants that remind us so much of what we need to be doing for others. You see something, you do something. And um, I, I think that's been one of the guiding principles of myself as well. You have to do something. Yeah, you being someone who has been um, working very hard for civil and human rights for most of your life. So quite an inspiration to you. And I would imagine you felt even more impassioned by being in his company. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was, uh, was at my first civil rights, I think, uh, endearment is, in 1968, when I was one of the seniors that was invited to go to South Carolina State College in 1968 in April, and that was following through two, three months, two and a half months earlier, where the three gentlemen were killed because of the Orangeburg massacre. So mm -hmm. it was from that day on, I can only say if there was a birth of a civil rights movement and a need to be a part and need to be speaking out and standing up regardless to what the consequences might be, I think that was where it started with me. So when I saw him and thinking he started out around that time and the, the, the sacrifices they made far different from what we were allowed to be a part of or could have been a part of, but um, he, we lost a giant here. We lost a, a giant and a, um, his work will never be forgotten. And what we can do, we're paying homage to him. As we said, we're celebrating him. We need to celebrate him for the continuation of his work. Thank you so much for that. And speaking of observing someone who has had such a long and lasting impact, I'm curious, Representative Cunningham, what was your first reaction when you met Congressman Lewis? Uh, of course, he represented the 5th District of Atlanta. For more than 30 years, he fought for the rights of all people, black, brown, white, LGBTQ rights. What was your reaction when you had an opportunity to meet or spend time with Congressman Lewis? Well, uh, first of all, Carolyn, thanks again for uh, hosting us. Thanks to you and uh, News too. And uh, I gotta say, it's great to see all uh, so many good friends on this call uh, here this evening, uh, all brought together to celebrate the life and legacy of uh, Congressman John Lewis. And and look, you know, if you had told me years ago that uh, that I would have had the opportunity to even meet uh, John Lewis, uh, let alone serve alongside him in, in Congress, uh, I would have thought you're crazy. Uh, it, it's like Dot said, this is somebody who is just larger than life, and um, you know that uh, that, sh that that shown was shown through every single day that I worked alongside him, and it was just it will continue to be the honor of my lifetime to be able to work with such a giant, um, and you know not somebody who just talks the talk, but somebody who walked the walk, you know. And there's a saying that um, you know the oaks take deeper root during the storms. And you look at the life of John Lewis and, and he did walk the walk. And when the going got tough, he got tough. You know, you look back at his legacy and, and how many times that he was beaten or thrown in jail because he was standing up for not only what he believed in, but he was standing up for the rights of, of others. And uh, I think that the, the greatest thing we can leave behind, anybody can leave behind is, is a legacy and the the opportunities for others and 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 Congressman Lewis, that that's that's his legacy, um, you know. Uh, and the fact is that whenever our country needed him most, he was there, and I got to see that firsthand in Congress uh, serving alongside him. Whenever an important vote came up or uh, there was a heated discussion in the House of Representatives, and whenever Congressman John Lewis uh, got behind the podium 
in the house and he starts speaking, you could hear a pin drop. You know, his voice carried that much weight because they knew of his legacy and people on, on both sides of the aisle respected him tremendously. And, uh, and he commanded the room uh, when, when he was speaking. And, uh, you know, um, as we continue mourning his loss, you know, our, our thoughts and prayers are with his family and his loved ones. And, and I, I think, I think Dot may have alluded to this, that uh, in honoring his legacy, it's, it's critically important that, that we continue that fight because there is so much more work that needs to be done. And uh, Congressman Lewis has taken us so far in his, his fight over the last several decades, but it's important that uh, other leaders, you know, pick up the torch and, and continue that, that march. And, uh, and because I think that that's the most effective and meaningful way we can, can honor his life and his legacy in moving forward. Were you surprised that he was not only concerned about um, civil as well as human rights, but also very concerned about the environment as well? Yeah, I mean, his, his heart was always in the right place on, on every issue. And, you know, uh, go back to, I think, what Sam opened up with and talking about his, his personality. It was, it was never about him. Uh, it was always about the cause. It's always about uh, doing what was right. And he's, you know, one of the most uh, humble people you ever meet. I mean, you think about this, literally a, a, a giant of a man. And whenever you spoke to him, uh, and you start to ask him questions about his past or his stories, which is something we all want to hear when, when we're speaking to him, he would touch on it and then move back to you and start talking about you and, and, and what you're doing and, and your future and things like that. I, my brother came up and visited me uh, in January and uh, I was asked him, I said, is there anybody you want to pull from the house forward that you'd like to meet? And it, without hesitation, one person, John Lewis. <laughs> And so I, I got, uh, went down to see Congressman Lewis on the floor. I said, I got my brother back here who wants to meet you. He said, oh yeah, of course, of course. Came back there and uh, just continued to talk to my brother for a while like he was the only person in the room. And, and again, didn't, didn't drown on about his accomplishments and what he's doing. He wanted to talk about my brother. He wanted to talk about whoever that person was. But that's just the, the, the heart of this man. Um, you know, just sincere and humble. And I think that the fact that it was never, it's never about him, it's never about uh, him personally, it's always about others uh, and other issues, whether it be in the environment or whether it be civil rights or in voting rights. And, and that's, I think that that uh, was a, a key point of, of what he stood for. And uh, although we've come a long way, we're, we're seeing a lot of voter suppression tactics now. And I, I think it's, it's great to have these conversations and talk about the legacy of uh, Congressman Lewis, but the I think the most the, the biggest way we can we can uh, honor him is by by continuing his fight and recognizing that uh, that there are still a lot of people who are uh, uh, or feel, who feel discrimination, who feel like they're left out of the system, who feel like their their voice or their vote doesn't count, and and we've done a lot in this session uh, to move that ball along, and I think it's incredibly important. We you know we we that that conversation continues and that work continues. I, I had to smile. Of course, we will talk about the Voting Rights Act, but um, Congressman, I, I had to smile when you talked about your brother wanting to meet him because I think in the hours after we all learned that Congressman Lewis passed away, you look on social media and everyone so proudly showed their own pictures of him because he was always willing to make time to stand and take a photo with someone regardless of who the person was he would always stand and smile and engage someone in yeah. a personal moment and i think we a lot of people certainly share that through social media over the last few days yeah and i had the, i had the honor of going down to selma uh just a few months ago and and taking that march across the bridge with him and i took my uh, uh my niece as who started the uh, Black Student Union uh, at her high school, the first one ever. And uh, having her experience that and her meet uh, Congressman Lewis, um, you know, was, was special for me because, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's that history and that torch being, being, being passed on to other generations and future generations and, and recognizing that, um, you know, John Lewis and people like him have, have fought so hard and that uh, 
that you know that 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 fight, like I said, it mu it must continue, and that's the most important way we can honor his lifetime of public service uh, to our country. And I understand that there is a move, a push, an effort to possibly have the Edmund Pettus Bridge renamed for John Lewis. Of course, we'll continue to follow that. Thank you so much, Representative, <laughs> and for your <laughs> comments. Um, you know, of course, we all know that. Uh, John Lewis grew up um, as the child of sharecroppers. Um, 1940, he was born in February outside of Troy, Alabama. Uh, he says that he was inspired by the words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whom he would hear on radio broadcast. And that was one of the things that compelled him to become a young activist. He attended Fisk University, an historically black college where he started organizing lunch counters in Nashville. And Representative Mack, I'm curious about what your first meeting was with Congressman Lewis, Lewis. and what he possibly shared with you. You, of course, have been an activist for most of your life and, and now moving to a, a different stage. But tell us about your first meeting and what his life of activism meant to you. The same story as everyone else. Um, you know, I, I'm reminded of the line, uh, line, the walk with kings and keep the common touch. He, and Congressman Cunningham was right on point. He made you, you know, because I've had this opportunity to meet him. I'm just asking questions. I'm curious. And he's asking me more questions than I'm asking him about my life. But I want us all to really appreciate and communicate, especially to younger folks, what he meant and the sacrifice. You know, in this day and time, we talk about, you know, we had a tough day. We have all the emails and text messages and going here and there. When he got up in the morning, he wasn't sure whether he was going to come back at night every day. But that's the commitment, that's the sacrifice he made so that we would be able to vote. Like remember as a small boy, uh, being my, my, my mother had me in Columbia, I was about seven years old. And I remember her holding my hand, we were walking past the Capitol. Blacks couldn't even walk on the grass to the Capitol. And I've had the honor of serving in that body. It's because of people like John Lewis. And if we all are to commemorate honor his memory in any way, we do it by one word, we vote. We vote, um, whether, you know, all elections, national elections, there's a lot of school board elections coming up, the state legislature, Congress, we vote. And, and that has to be drilled into everybody, whether they're black, white, Asian, Latino, Native American, it doesn't matter, it needs to be drilled into all of us. And I'm hopeful and prayerful when all is said and done, we can come out with a coalition of people that have a set of values like John Lewis that will make us all better. And I'm very disturbed about where we are now as a country, we're so divided, but, but I believe there's a lot more quote unquote good people, as I said, of all colors. We have to form that coalition, come together, and for the good of the country, do the right thing. And that, I think, is one of the key things. That's how we uh, commemorate, memorize, honor John Lewis. You use the word good, Representative Mack, and that's where I want to springboard onto something we all know when we think about the life and legacy of John Lewis, and that is that he said, never be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. I'd like to speak with uh, Reverend Dr. Kylon Middleton about what this good trouble was that John Lewis talked about. He was arrested 45 times and they were all as a result of fighting for justice, freedom, for voting rights, as a lot of people have already alluded to. Let's talk about the good trouble that Congressman Lewis talked about and wanted to people to participate in. Doctor. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, Congressman John Lewis was an extraordinary man. Of course, uh, he was a man of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. And so he uh, really exemplified those high ideals. We, we shared that bond together uh, being in that fraternity. And those of us who are 
uh, members of uh, black fraternal organizations realize that they don't end with college, right? And so he really lifted up those ideals of brotherhood, scholarship, and service. And in 2017, my fondest memory was when he was inducted into our fraternity's distinguished service chapter, which is the highest honor uh, that a, a brother could receive uh, within Phi Beta Sigma, along with uh, such notable brothers like Elaine uh, Leroy Locke and A. Philip Randolph, John uh, Lewis always uh, recognized that uh, good trouble was uh, something that those who wanted to be change agents needed to get themselves into. He re uh, recalled that story of uh, talking with his grandparents and, and they told him not to get into trouble. And he recognized that in order to really be that kind of agitator as, uh, as Cleveland Sellers calls it, an outside uh, agitator, uh, you had to really get yourself in the mix and, and based on voting rights, based on um, human rights, really looking at uh, what he did and endured in Alabama and taking that fight to uh, Georgia and then now to the uh, Capitol in which uh, he, he has opened the doors for many uh, individuals to be able, as you talked about LGBTQ, uh, right, uh, those who are, as we would call in, in some sectors of our society, uh, those who have been marginalized, those who, who have been pushed aside, those who have been cast out, those were the individuals that John Lewis would be fighting for. And the good trouble that he got into made our lives better and continue to compel us uh, to be better people. It, it, it causes the equitable bar to be raised so that we could then look around our society at inequities and disparities and look at uh, areas within education, healthcare, areas within um, even fair wages uh, that uh, individuals should have an opportunity toward this American dream that John Lewis recognized that we all need to be uh, rolling up our sleeves, getting into trouble, uh, equalizing those areas so that we might make uh, the American dream more accessible for everybody. So that good trouble that he talks about uh, has inspired uh, activism in all of us. Uh, as we even listen to the words of John Lewis, as uh, this week I've just been watching old footage and videos and films of uh, his speeches and just talks that he had given. And it reminds me, it ignites in, in me and hopefully all of us, uh, the need to and the passion uh, to be uh, agents of change, uh, good agents of change that begin uh, to make this world, not, not just our individual areas, but this world a better place. Yeah, someone who certainly, I mean, not only said it, but was willing to go on the front lines knowing that he would be beaten, possibly killed, but continue to go. And I think some people these days wouldn't even consider uh, taking that kind of risk for someone who they might never meet. And uh, so you, uh, as you described uh, Dr. Middleton, looking and hearing his voice throughout the week in preparation for this night, and since learning of his, of his passing, just spending hours just listening to it over and over again, I think it certainly does ignite um, for a lot of people a desire to do more for someone other than self. Yes, I agree. This this sort of selfless service, you know, is embodied in John Lewis. You know, he he never did it for himself. I, I recall just even recently uh, when he was with the mayor of of uh, Washington D.C. as they you know uh, were lifting up Black lives, and and it doesn't minimize any any other life mattering. Uh, he, he wanted to be there for that moment uh, that they were making a bold statement that Black Lives Matter, uh, because it does. Black Lives Matter and all lives matter. And even in his weakened, compromised uh, health condition, he was still serving selflessly. And, and I think that if I had taken anything, you know, from his life, it, it just really emphasizes for me that it, it can't be about the individual. It has to be, you know, about humanity. It has to be about causes bigger than just uh, stroking individual egos and, and, and trying to uh, self-engrandize uh, the, the person. But John Lewis taught us how we can begin to win and everybody wins because when we do those things that are right and righteous and those things that are uh, justifiable as it relates to equity for all, everybody wins and it does not matter who gets the credit as long as we can all uh, live that same uh, life that 
typifies the the dream. So that selfless service becomes one that's that's one that people don't really, you know, embody that as much anymore. But you know, and I was just thinking, I'm not going to monopolize the conversation, but we don't have uh, servants like John Lewis. I mean, I, I was just, you know, assessing myself, I said, well, you know, th these individuals from 18 years old to 80 years old, I mean, a life dedicated to service. And so, you know, who will be the next John Lewis? And we have many of them in this, in the, on this panel tonight. And we have to always sow into the lives of individuals. I, I listened to his director of communication even uh, yesterday, and she was talking about how he loved young people and young people like children. And he would spend time with them, sowing into them and, and, and really imprinting in them that, that uh, need to be selfless in their service so that that could be perpetuating for the next generation. And, and we have to do that, because if we don't have many John Lewis's coming along, uh, then our future would not be as hopeful. But it is hopeful because he did uh, leave that legacy with all of us. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Middleton. Uh, Representative Moore, the congressional election of 1986 was a remarkable one because it put John Lewis against a friend of his talking about Julian Bond. It was an unlikely race, and of course, we know the way it ended with Congressman Lewis being in Congress for more than 30 years. Um, but, but let's talk about how that came about and how he became this person who always seemed approachable to most people, implacable is a way some people would describe him, and yet an unstoppable force as a lawmaker. Representative Moore. Yeah, yeah, once again, thank y'all so much for putting this on. Um, I uh, real quickly uh, have to tell my John Lewis story. Um, I, uh, I think back uh, about, you know, why I'm a, a representative and, I, and I've been, it started for me uh, when my dad got involved in the civil rights movement in 1962, he was 32 years old. Uh, him and John Lewis are like 10 years apart. My dad would, uh, would have been uh, 90 this year. And, uh, and I think about all the stuff that my dad always taught me about the movement and how uh, so often those that got involved were young people and most of the time they were very young people and John Lewis was a very young person when he got involved and he spent his entire life uh, putting service above self, something that my father instilled in me all of my life. And so I think the approachability that you're talking about comes from um, uh, those uh, individuals that uh, started out in the movement. A lot of them, we look at them as heroes and giants, but in those moments, a lot of them had fear. I mean, you know, you, you have folks that were, their lives were being threatened almost every day, um, but somehow they found strength through their belief in God and their, uh, their understanding that uh, if not now, then when, and if not you, then who, stepping up to the, to the moment and I had an opportunity to, to meet uh, uh, Congressman Lewis on several occasions. I, I never felt comfortable asking him for a picture, but now I see all of my friends on, on, on Facebook and Twitter getting pictures with him. I was actually took my, my chance, but, but the memories I have of him, I remember one time going up to the United States Capitol and meeting him. And literally he was walking into a building and I was like, that's Congressman Lewis. And, and he could hear me, so he turned around and we spoke. And I left that conversation just so inspired by just the, the strength and the power of his humility. Uh, you know, oftentimes people look at those that are humble as weakness, but he really was able to uh, use his humility and his humbleness uh, to strength. And, and it shows so much strength how humble he was. And, um, I, you know, I just, I've been inspired by his life. All of us have been watching um, old clips of, of, his, of his life over the past uh, several days as, as, as we hear uh, about his death. But to be honest with you, I'm just so joyful that he lived. And so, um, you, know, you know, similar with, with, my, with my father's life and, and people like Congressman uh, uh, Clyburn uh, and so many other people, um, 
I'm just so happy and I and I just I rejoice in their life and, and I try not to mourn their death because you know he gave us 80 years foot to the gas the whole time um you know those 80 hour weeks that my mom always talked about 40 hours to pay the bills and the other 40 hours to give back to the community and that was John Lewis he was he was an 80 hour a week working person caring deeply about progress uh in this uh in this great nation of ours thank you so much for for sharing that representative Moore. um you know one of the things that i think we all know is how tirelessly congressman lewis wrote uh, worked toward the rights of all to be able to vote and representative clyburn wrote today Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell should honor John with not only his words, but with his deeds. The Senate should take up H.R. 4 and name it the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act of 2020. I'd like to go back to Sam Scarden. Um, Sam, I'd like to know your reaction to that and what you believe uh, Congressman Lewis's reaction would be to that. Absolutely, Carolyn. I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, as I think all, everyone has said here, he was the ultimate man of action. He was not just for civil rights. He put his life on the line for it over and over again. Uh, he was a leader in the Congress for causes like voting rights for 30 plus years. So uh, I agree. I, I think it, the renaming the bridge in Selma, I thought was a very touching tribute, but I think the tribute that he would appreciate even more is a full and, and strong reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act uh, and passing HR 4, like you mentioned. Uh, one thing I do want to add, uh, I'm hearing a common theme here, of, uh, his humility and his ability to take any person and make them feel like the only person in the room. Congressman Cunningham mentioned his brother. Uh, Jay, as a staff member who was trying to get him through those crowds, thank you for not stopping him for a picture. Uh, his, <laughs> the story of my time working for him was telling people that he didn't have time for pictures because uh, he would always say yes. So unfortunately, I fell the staff to say no. Uh, in fact, his own family at one point stopped flying with him because he would land at whatever airport he was going to and it would take another two hours just to get out to the car because he would stop at the airport at every single person on the plane and who was getting on the plane he would have a conversation with and take pictures with. And so I think his own son started flying different flights than he did uh, just to avoid the getting stuck in the airports. But that, that's reflective of a, a larger trend in his life that I think we're all picking up on is and something he would say directly sometimes I heard him say is that one of his greatest concerns and one of his greatest worries was that future generations wouldn't understand the depth and the importance of the philosophies involved in the civil rights movement. So not just that people didn't just wake up one day and decide to go do sit-ins or, or ride on buses, uh, march and speak on the steps of Lincoln Memorial. It was a very coordinated, well-studied, well-planned effort. Uh, there were long training sessions and classes that a lot of these activists and leaders went through uh, to study nonviolence and the principles of so, uh, civil disobedience and how effective they could be. I mean, they studied religious texts. Uh, they studied Gandhi in South Africa and India, uh, later Mandela. Um, the concepts were, uh, we need to train ourselves extremely well in these philosophies. And you need to train yourself that if someone meets you with violence, that you don't, kind of, you fight that urge to respond with violence of your own. Uh, so that was really very extremely important to him. And something he tried to communicate to every single person he met and every, especially young people, um, like so many of y'all mentioned, was that uh, he really saw it as up to us to not just understand what he did, you know, the history of what he did, but the philosophies and the values behind it. Uh, that's why he took, you know, he would take an hour with anybody because uh, he would, thought it was so important to pass on that knowledge and that history. And so I'm glad so many people experienced that again, as a staff member, I, it's a little frustrating when your boss needs to be somewhere and uh, he wants to stop and have those conversations in the hall. Uh, but I, I'm glad so many people benefited from it. And I hope that's the message we're all carrying on here too. Sam, thank you for sharing that. And as a legislative aide, I hope that we'll be able to speak with you one more time so that you can share some personal reflections, things that you may know about Congressman Lewis that a lot of us may not know and, and perhaps what you talked about in those quiet moments when things were 
uh, not under the, uh, the public's eye or under some bright spotlight. So thank you very much for, for being a part of this and for sharing your personal reflections. You know, I think it's also important that we recognize that Congressman Lewis passed away of pancreatic cancer on the same day his friend C.T. Vivian passed away. Vivian, perhaps known to those who dig a little bit deeper in uh, civil and human rights history, but the two were both protégés of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Lewis and Vivian actually meeting in seminary. Uh, Vivian lived in the Midwest for a period of time, but then came back to Atlanta. But perhaps what a lot of people don't know is that he was one of the curators of the Upward Bound program, uh, worked very closely with Jesse Jackson in Jackson's presidential bid, but stayed very active throughout his life. I was wondering who might wanna comment on perhaps the relationship between the two of them, but also just the, the emotion when you consider that these two um, amazing people in civil rights passed away on the same day. Well, I'd like to mention, um, I didn't have one of those moments that even op gave me the opportunity to take a picture with, uh, uh, with uh, John Lewis. I didn't get an opportunity because I was so afraid to approach him <laughs> to come near him because he was such a giant and such a an icon in the eyes of others. And, and that was also the case for um, C.T. Vivian. They're, they're very iconic individuals. And so my time while I was in Atlanta, I could see them, but I saw them from afar and even had an opportunity a few years ago to send youth from our congregation there. But one of the things that, that I am excited about in, in recognizing, honoring, and remembering is that all of those giants appear to me as in the biblical text where there's a story of a paralytic man and that the men want to get this paralytic to Jesus and as they're making their way there they can't get through and so they willingly go up and tear off the roof and I think that's the good trouble that those pastors did in the work as civil rights leaders. They tore roofs off and they lowered down whatever was wrong in order to get it to the place where it could be made well. And so I am I'm honored to be with you um, because I, I enjoy being in this place and space, but it, it just excites me that we can see the biblical text that, the, that they all, um, Dr. King, all of them, the entire Reverend Lowry, all of them that that really honored what they studied and learned from the biblical text and their Christian tradition, and to see it come to life as the four individuals that tore the roof off and lowered down the paralytic problem. And if you ever look at the text, you never see those guys again, but you always know of the work that they've done. So I'm just excited that the work that Councilman uh, Lewis has done has inspired me to serve in the justice area, uh, in Charleston area justice ministry here locally, because that's what we're supposed to do. Find a way to tear the roof off. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate that, Reverend Cecilia Armstrong. And, you know, one of the things that I thought when you listen to Congressman Lewis and you listen to or read some of the things that he said, and, and we talk about his humility, and as you just described, that story of tearing the roof off and then never seeing them again. Um, in 2010, President Obama awarded Congressman Lewis with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which of course is America's highest civilian honor. And after that ceremony in 2011, Congressman Lewis said, quote, if, if somebody told me one day I would be standing in the White House and an African-American president presenting me the Medal of Freedom, I would have said, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? He was a humble man. Chaplain Jenkins, when you think about his humility, what comes to mind? Well, I, I think uh, Demet actually wasn't able to join us. So, oh, uh, she is not on the line. Okay. But, All right. but I, do, I do think it's important for some of our clergy on the line here to talk about that, Carolyn, because uh, the church did play a huge role in Congressman Lewis's life. He grew up wanting to be a, a pastor, uh, 
he would preach to the chickens. He famously told a lot of people when he was eight years old living on a farm, uh, he knew he wanted to be a minister one day. And so he would train himself and teach himself to preach by gathering the chickens in the chicken yard and giving the Sunday sermon to them once a week. Uh, and so that, and of course, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King, uh, C.T. Vivian, you, Vivian, you mentioned, uh, so many great leaders of the civil rights movement were ministers. Uh, so that's, I think we should kick that question over to them and give them a chance to answer that. Well, certainly, you know, I'll, I'll jump right in. I was looking for an entry point to jump in anyway. And, and John Lewis did say, not one of us can rest, be happy, be at home, be at peace peace with ourselves until we end hatred and division. And C.T. Vivian also created an institute that then uh, became an incubator that it would teach, you know, for, in posterity or in perpetuity, individuals how to really nonviolently protest. And when you look at those giants, and, and we continue using, um, you know, giants of the movement, uh, these two individuals exiting the scene becomes an opportunity for the baton to be passed. And I think that they have sowed uh, a good seed and, and they have really uh, planted um, a legacy in good soil so that those of us who come after them, you know, we have almost <laughs> A, a blueprint uh, of sorts to uh, to begin to show generations to come how we can be that beloved community community that Martin Luther King talked about. Going back to, I, I just want to kind of dovetail back into that uh, that voting rights uh, bill that's been kind of waylaid and and held up and uh, as, as the House passed it to the Senate and uh, Ms. McConnell will not bring it to the floor. It's 200 and some days. And so I think both Vivian and uh, Lewis, uh, there's an, a righteous indignation that stirred in both of them a passion uh, that they would not accept such things. And so I don't know what's happening in government now to the extent, but these men held uh, truth, spoke truth to power and held uh, these individuals to account. Mitch McConnell voted for this uh, reauthorization of the, that voting rights uh, bill every time it came up. And so why on earth are we now going through this? And so I do feel that both men through their, uh, their indignation, the righteous indi indignation through um, their teachings and belief in faith compels them uh, to cause individuals who are in power and those who uh, are ruling in our land to do the right thing. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to also get Representative Cunningham back into the conversation to talk about the way Congressman Lewis was received amongst other members of the House as well as the Senate. Um, certainly, we know that everyone may not agree on particular pieces of legislation, but when he walked into chambers, what was the reaction and was he able to uh, bring people together on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, you know, he commanded the room and whenever he was the go to whenever uh, uh, the house was in need of a fiery speech to motivate people or to try to bring people together or to highlight, uh, you know, the, the desperate need for action, uh, because this was a man of action. Uh, this wasn't a man who just like I said, who just spoke words. Um, he, he had a history uh, behind it. And so uh, whenever, whenever he spoke, people listened because of um, his credibility. And I'll just uh, follow along with what, what Dr. Middleton was, was, was saying is that um, we need more action. And especially with the, um, uh, you know, the Voting Rights Advancement Act, I was, a proud, I was a, a proud to co-sponsor that, uh, HR4, and not just to lend my name, but to, you know, to state that the, the district, the first district uh, stands with him in doing this because, uh, you know, we, uh, we experience some of the same issues on many different levels. You know, I've represented a district that is gerrymandered, uh, that is drawn by politicians to pick their voters and still allowing voters to pick their politicians. And the fact of the matter is that this fight is still waging on and, and, and these tactics are still being employed um, by, uh, by certain politicians, and it is voter suppression, whether it be closing uh, polling locations in minority communities or uh, gerrymandering or voter suppression, and, and that just calls uh, the need for, you know, 
passing the Voting Rights Advancement Act. And, uh, you know, we've also got other pieces of legislation that that open up the ballot box uh, and and stop these voter suppression, you know, passing uh, H.R. 1, the For the People Act, uh, in the beginning of this session that created automatic voter registration that expanded early voting uh, and, you know, that, that versed, you know, restored voting rights of citizens who have served felony sentences. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we, we can, can be doing and should be doing that, um, that, that, w that are the best way to honor his legacy. And, you know, I can't think of a better way, you know, it's, it, it'd be a great to rename the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge in honor of John Lewis. Uh, it'd be even better, though, to pass the legislation for things that he fought for to let, you know, to, to let his family knows that, that his legacy continues, that his work continues. And I think that I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with what Dr. Middleton said. We need action right now, and we need Senator McConnell to take this bill up, uh, to pass it so that we can impact not only the people who are, you know, currently being disenfranchised, but the generations to follow. Thank you so much, Representative Cunningham. We have just about 15 minutes left in our discussion, and certainly it has been a great one to hear the personal stories and how the life of Congressman Lewis has impacted your life personally as well as professionally. I'd like to give each of you about a minute and a half to express final thoughts about Congressman Lewis and the impact on your life. Let's start with uh, Representative Mack. Is Representative Max still on the call? Okay, let's go. Representative J.A. Moore. Yes, I'm here. I had, oh. for some reason, I had trouble getting unmuted. I kept hitting the Thank button. Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> but um, yes, I'm, I, I'm honored to be on the call. It was, uh, and again, the message I want, would like to get to everyone and not, I mean, everyone on this call knows this, but to get the, the public, to get the young folks that um, uh, Reverend Vivian, um, uh, uh, Lewis, they died for us the, to have the opportunity, somebody that looks like me, to have the opportunity to go sit at a lunch counter and have a cup of coffee. Uh, we that live in Charleston, at one point, uh, African-American police officers could not arrest a white person. They had to call a white police officer to arrest them. Um, you know, just so many things as relates to personal dignity and respect, not to mention rights. So we need to be able to continue, continue to communicate that to young folks, have that discussion. And I keep saying, let me end by this, forming that coalition, because again, there's two ways that people have power, their vote and how they spend their money. And I'm not just talking about black folk, everyone especially black folks, our vote and how we spend our money. So, and, um, and, and, and Doc Scott can tell you, our voting numbers are awful, awful. That continues to be the thing. So again, I would like to end by saying an honor, in order to honor Congressman John Lewis, let's make sure that we get the numbers right so people can vote, we treat each other with dignity, dignity and respect, and demand that other people treat us with dignity and respect. Thank you very much, Representative Mack. Ms. Dodd? Yes, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I think this, to take the time to remember and honor the Congressman is a wonderful way to spend this afternoon as we look back at the work that he's done and remind ourselves, and I said remind ourselves and remind ourselves, we too have much left to be done. And um, in order for our young people to understand what they need to continue to do, and I am so proud of these young people now, because far too often I think some of us have possibly not done all that we could. And if we can, uh, really look within and said, what else can I do? If he gives me 50 years, that's only 50 years I can work. But if he gives me 80, I should be working 
all 80 of those years. And I think that's where we need to go back to for those of us who either ourselves or people we know, we need to remind them the work is not, it's not done yet. It, we're not done yet. Uh, we're still having some of the same problems. We still get as many calls with, with uh, the issues of discrimination. We're still quietly trying to fight rather, rather than being on a press conference every month. We're trying to have that dialogue with the businesses, the uh, folks that uh, uh, our citizens are having problems with, with our law enforcers. We're trying to work those things out. And we're not there yet. We're absolutely not there yet. And I think that our church, uh, when we mentioned just earlier about the fact that so many of these civil rights, these, I mean, these giants, these, these men and women, they were rooted in their religion and their belief and, and what really needs to be done. Because you can't love anybody else until, until you really love yourself. And when you love yourself in a way that says, you know what, I've been chosen to do this work, then we do it. We do it and we never give up. And we're at a point, I think a pivotal point at this time, that we need to fight even harder. And I, I think John, he'd be looking down and say, yeah, get into the service. He would say, good trouble. Get into the trouble. That's and I thank you all for being, being a part of this. We appreciate your voice being a part of this conversation as well. Lista, thank you so much. Um, Let's go to Representative J.A. Moore. Uh, yeah, just in, just in closing, I, I want to want to thank uh, you all for uh, for spending time on this very important person uh, in uh, the story that is being written about America. Um, and for me, I, I kind of want to piggyback on what uh, Dot Scott said. Um, I think now more than ever, uh, we honor his legacy by pouring everything in to these young people that have uh, become activated uh, in this generation, in this time, um, in the aftermath of uh, George Floyd and uh, Ahmaud Arbery and uh, Breonna Taylor, um, that, that we pour into them support. Um, because those of us that have, uh, that are, are sons and daughters of, of civil rights uh, leaders, uh, we realized that, you know, the movement was really, it was young people that were putting their lives, literally their lives on the line for, for that. And I think sometimes as we become more experienced, we forget that. So uh, my task that, I, that I, I put on myself is I have to pour into these young people, uh, the Black Lives Matter organization here in Charleston, which is uh, predominantly led by very young people, you know, college age students and high school age students and, and, and young people in their 20s that, that and, and, and all of the other movements that are happening simultaneously uh, throughout this uh, state and country that I must do everything I can to pour support, uh, to support love uh, and, and more than anything, uh, the work that is needed to be done. My dad always would, would say that um, progress doesn't come because you wish for it progress comes because you work for it. I believe Congressman Lewis would agree with your dad. Thank you very much for, for sharing that, Representative Moore. Representative Joe Cunningham. Well, uh, Carolyn, thanks again uh, to you and Channel 2 for putting this on. And so Great uh, to be part of such a distinguished panel of uh, my friends, colleagues, um, and uh, elected officials, and the future elected officials, and uh, you know, in, in honoring um, the service and the life of of Congressman John Lewis. And you, you know, I think I think I think back to um, what my pastor says in church during the altar call at the end of every service. He always closes it with two questions. That's what's God telling you and what are you going to do about it? And as we reflect on the life of Congressman John Lewis, it's good to, to think about the legacy he leaves behind and remember that, but it begs the second question is, what are you going to do about it? And here in Congress, 
I'm going to continue to fight for voting rights. I'm going to continue to push legislation so that everyone is treated fairly, no matter uh, their their race or uh, their religion, the color of skin, their gender. Um, the same things that Congressman John Lewis gave his life to. Uh, we're going to continue that fight. And I think it's incumbent upon each and every one of us, whether we're in, we're in office or not, to find that cause and, and recognize that there is still much work to be done and that each and every one of us has a role to play, whether or not we're in office or we're not in office or, or, or whatever job we have, uh, there's something to be done. And there's, there's tons of ways to get involved. There's tons of community groups. Uh, there's just um, every single way in order to make an impact and to continue the work uh, that Congressman John Lewis has started and, you know, challenge everyone to, uh, to pick that up and do whatever it is that they can uh, to make sure that, that voting rights are expanded and everyone is treated equally and fairly under the law. Thank you again for having us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Representative Cunningham. We appreciate your time. Reverend Cecilia Armstrong of St. James Presbyterian Church. Well, one of the things, there are a couple of images that all come to my mind uh, as I want to remember him. Thank you for having me with you in this, in this discussion, one that could go on forever and a day. Um, and part of that, uh, the image that comes to my mind comes, uh, is the Sankofa bird uh, that's always going forward but doesn't forget about the pearl that's on its back. And I see the life of, of Congressman John Lewis in that manner. I also saw recently a, a cartoon uh, drawn or, or an image drawn, uh, and I can't, and I forgive me for not being able to honor the artist, but it was a, an image of John Lewis as a bridge uh, that led to voters' rights. And a friend of mine said that her grandmother used to tell her, don't forget the bridge you cross to get where you have to go. And so we, we honor him in that respect. But I also know that everybody needs a vehicle for travel. If we're going to talk about getting where we have to go, there has to be a vehicle to help us get there. And so I am appreciative of those who are serving in the, the various capacities that they are in the government. And I am encouraging others to, to join with CAJUM, the Charleston Area Justice Ministry, a place and opportunity that will constantly build for, the, um, for equity and for a just society. And, I, and, I, and so I'm hoping that the work we do collectively as, a, as people power, um, and, you know, none of us have the money to run everything, but we always can gather as people and do what he has done, and that is to love others enough through uh, the issues that need to be resolved. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Reverend Cecilia Armstrong of St. James Presbyterian Church. Reverend Dr. Kylon Middleton, pastor of Mount Zion AME. Yes, uh, thank you again, Carolyn News 2, and to the Coastal Crisis Chaplaincy for putting on this forum and to all of these distinguished panelists. Uh, John Lewis was a transformative agent. Uh, he took his bull bully pulpit as a student activist, uh, and he was an outside agitator and then became the conscience of the Congress. He recognized that he had to get off the bench and he had to really get in the game in order uh, to be on the inside, causing change to happen. Uh, from within. So I just uh, you leave that thought that um, we all have bully pulpits. It could be for domestic violence awareness. It could be uh, bringing about, uh, you know, peace and harmony on the streets on the east side of Charleston. Whatever it is God has called us to do, John Lewis becomes the exemplar that you can take that bully pulpit and you can begin to preach and you can begin to proclaim uh, the righteousness of God until uh, justice is won. And so we all have that opportunity today uh, to use him as a light, a witness, and an example so that we too can transform this world. Dr. Middleton, thank you very much. And finally, Sam Scarden, former aide to Representative Lewis, someone who spent a lot of professional as well as personal time with the congressman. Your final thoughts? Sure. Thank you again, Carolyn. And I just say uh, to connect Congressman Lewis to South Carolina, take one minute and say the first time he was here, uh, we didn't welcome him, welcome him well. He was a freedom rider and was actually beaten uh, in a bus station in Rock Hill, uh, bloody, uh, blood all over his shirts. There's very famous pictures of that uh, back in 1961 and on the freedom rides. Uh, I had the opportunity when I was working for him to bring him back to my hometown here in Charleston. And he used to give these great speeches whenever he visited new cities and he loved coming to Charleston and he got fired up. He gave a great speech here at, um, 
Morris Brown AME and said, never give up, never give in, keep the faith, keep your eyes on the prize. And that same time I was working for him, a gentleman from South Carolina had come into our office and uh, said, I'd like to meet with the congressman. And he did. Turned out that that was the same gentleman who had beaten him in the bus station in Rock Hill 50 years earlier. Wanted to apologize to him. Uh, they hugged, they cried. They went on the Oprah Winfrey show together. Uh, if that's not a reason to keep the faith and never give up and never give in, then I don't know what is. And so uh, that's a very inspiring message I take from the life of Congressman Lewis and that inspires me and I think all of us to keep moving forward. So thank you again and it's been an honor to be with all of you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And, and I think that last story is one that we will never forget. And it was an amazing moment to witness on TV and so happy that it once again sheds light on the possibilities. And that's one thing that I believe the Congressman shared with the world is that there are possibilities as long as you stay motivated and committed to your principles. I remember Sam, when he came for that um, appearance at Morris, Morris Street Baptist AME, I'm sorry, Morris Street Baptist Church. I in fact was there with my daughter and, and, and you may remember it as well. And I interviewed him, it was very soon after his wife passed away, Ms. Lillian. And what I remember most about that interview was that he spent as much time in the interview with me as he did speaking with my 10 year old daughter. And whenever I have an opportunity to share that picture, though it is out of focus and not quite clear and you know a lot of things wrong with it, it is so important to me because I wanted her to not only have that moment to understand his place in history, but also to know her possible place in history. And so that is what I take away from my time meeting uh, US Representative John Lewis. He certainly leaves a formidable legacy. He was a figure of moral authority. He was grounded in his principles of, of equal rights and human rights and also taking care of the environment and his willingness to take a beating so that others would be better. So to our guests, I thank each of you for being with us. U.S. Representative Joe Cunningham, South Carolina Representative David Mack III, South Carolina Representative J.A. Moore, President of the Charleston Chapter of the NAACP, Dot Scott, Reverend Dr. Kyla Middleton, Pastor of Mount Zion AME Church, uh, Sam Scarden, former A to Representative Lewis, and Reverend Cecilia Armstrong of St. James Presbyterian Church. And to those of you watching and listening, thank you so much for being a part of this discussion, for listening. And we thank also the Coastal Crisis Chaplaincy for partnering with News 2 and allowing us this opportunity to remember and honor the life and legacy of Congressman John Lewis. Thank you again, everyone, and good night.